Good morning. I'm Stephanie Shearholtz with NASA's Office of Communications. Welcome to our over overview briefing for NASA's Artemis I mission. The agency is currently targeting no earlier than Monday, August 29th, for liftoff of the Space Launch System rocket that will propel the Orion spacecraft on its mission around the moon and back to Earth. The first in a series of increasingly complex missions, Artemis I will be an uncrewed flight test that will provide a foundation for deep space exploration and demonstrate our commitment and capability to extend human existence to the moon and on to Mars. We have several experts here to talk with us today about the Artemis I mission. Here in the room with me are NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Mike Serafin, the Artemis I Mission Manager here at NASA Headquarters, Pavia Lal, Associate Administrator for Technology, Policy, and Strategy at NASA Headquarters. Joining us from Kennedy Space Center in Florida is Charlie Blackwell-Thompson, the Artemis I Launch Director. Joining from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, we have John Honeycutt, Space Launch System Program Manager. And joining us from Johnson Space Center in Houston is Howard Hugh, the Orion Program Manager. Each of our speakers will share opening remarks, then we'll take questions from reporters on the phone line. Reporters can enter the queue by pressing star one on their phone at any time. First, we'll have remarks from NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. To the NASA family, thank you for what you do every day, in and out. You make the impossible possible. And thanks, Stephanie. Just 26 days, most powerful rocket ever built, KSC, historic launch pad, 39B. It's no stranger to monster rockets. Saturn V was there, 7.6 million pounds of thrust. This baby's going to be 8.8. .8. Uh, the Saturn V took us to the moon a half a century ago. And now, as we embark on the first Artemis test flight, we recall this agency's storied past but our eyes are focused, not the immediate future, but out there. It's a future where NASA will land the first woman and the first po person of color on the moon. And on these increasingly complex missions, astronauts will live and work in deep space and will develop the science and technology to send the first humans to Mars. We're going to Mars and we're going back to the moon in order to learn to live, to work, to survive. How do you keep humans alive in those hostile conditions? And uh, we're gonna learn how to use the resources on the moon in order to be able to build things in the future as we go, not a quarter of a million miles away, not a three-day journey, but millions and millions of miles away on a months and months, if not years, journey. And we're going together. We're going with our commercial partners, and we're going with our international partners. On Artemis II, the first Canadian will fly. Uh, it will be the first Canadian astronaut to go to the moon. Uh, the first European and Japanese astronauts will fly around the moon on the Gateway, which is our lunar outpost. The Space Launch System, this rocket, is the only capable rocket of sending humans into deep space, and it's the most powerful in the world. And so you're going to see the evolution 
of this rocket. It's at one height now, and by Artemis IV, it's going to be taller, and it's going to be more powerful. And then on top of it is the spacecraft, Orion. And on this mission, Orion will venture farther than any spacecraft built for humans has ever flown. It will be on a mission of over a million miles to the moon and back and all kinds of orbits around the moon testing this spacecraft. It's a mission of 42 days. And after its long flight test, Orion will come home faster and hotter than any spacecraft has before. It's coming back at 32 Mach. It's going to hit the Earth's atmosphere at 32 times the speed of sound. It's going to dip into the atmosphere and bleed off some of that speed before it starts descending through the atmosphere. On the space shuttle, we were at 25 Mach, which is about 17,500 miles an hour. Uh, this heat shield of Orion is built so that it will stand the hotter environment as it's coming in first at 32 Mach. You come back from Mars, it might be at 36 Mach. So we've got a lot of testing to do. Uh, and once that spacecraft, we're testing this heat shield. It's the most advanced heat shield ever. Once uh, it comes into the atmosphere, then it's going to slow down to, uh, before the parachutes are deployed, about 300 miles an hour. Now, last week we were down at Kennedy, and I was in the vehicle uh, assembly building with a bunch of students and letting them look up on a surprise visit. It was the, the ones at the KSC camp, and uh, you should have seen them. They didn't know. This was a surprise that Bob Cabana and I did for these kids. Uh, you should have seen the utter amazements of the kids that they looked up at this behemoth in the vehicle assembly building, looking up at the SLS. We saw the hard work of thousands of people around the world that was proudly on display right there, and soon that baby is rolling back out to the pad. 17 stories high, solid rocket boosters, enormous core stage holding the liquid hydrogen and oxygen tanks. And then underneath Orion, the spacecraft, uh, is the European service module, the powerhouse of the Orion spacecraft that will provide Orion with power and life support for the astronauts for the future flights. And that comes from our friends at ESA, European Space Agency. And I'm telling you, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Europe, and they are gaga. They are so excited about NASA and what's happening and to be a part of it. And it tells you something about NASA. It tells you about our international program and our international outreach. And so this uh, rocket is an incredible feat. And I want to underscore that this is a test flight. It's just the beginning. We've learned a lot over the years. We've learned a lot that we're going to be able to apply in the coming years. Developing a new rocket, and this is a new rocket. It's a derivation of the solid rocket boosters from the shuttle. Four segments. This is five segments. It's a derivation of the core stage for the space shuttle, but so much different so much larger, more complex. And when you look at the rocket, it almost looks retro. Looks like that we're looking back toward the Saturn V, but it's a totally different, new, highly sophisticated, more sophisticated rocket and spacecraft. 
And we're going to learn from this Artemis I. We're, we're learning through the challenges, the accomplishments. Artemis I shows that we can do big things, things that unite people, things that benefit humanity, things like Apollo that inspire the world. This is now the Artemis generation. We were in the Apollo generation. This is a new generation. This is a new type of astronaut. And to all of us that gaze up at the moon, dreaming of the day humankind returns to the lunar surface, folks, we're here. We are going back. And that journey, our journey, begins with Artemis I. This team is going to tell you today uh, more about our goals for the mission and what's on board. They're going to explain how these mission objectives are going to inform our future, inform how our crewed missions to the moon are going to be and beyond. And remember, it's not the sky that's the limit. We're learning from the James Webb Space Telescope how big this universe is. It's the universe is the limit. So let's go Artemis One. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next, Mike Serafin will give us an overview of the mission and the primary mission objectives. And Pavialal will talk about some of the payloads riding along on this mission that have the potential to contribute knowledge to future exploration missions. Over to you, Mike. OK, good morning. And uh, thank you for your interest in our mission and our program. Uh, if we could r roll the video, we'll uh, set some expectations about what some of the major mission highlights are that you may see throughout the course of Artemis 1. Rollout will occur in about two weeks and that'll signal that launch is near. The entire mobile launch tower as well as the rocket and the spacecraft will head out to the launch pad together and be positioned at launch complex 39B over a flame trench. We'll load it with cryo, uh, the uh, fuel and oxidizer into the core stage as well as the upper stage. And when all systems are go, we'll give the go for launch, and Artemis 1 will begin. The 32-story tall rocket will climb its way up through the atmosphere, and in two minutes, all the solid propellant and the boosters will be consumed and jettisoned, as well as all the liquid fuel in eight minutes, uh, and the core stage will be jettisoned. The upper stage, as well as the Orion spacecraft, will then proceed in one lap around the Earth. Orion will deploy its solar rays and get off a of battery power, and then we'll commit to the moon at the point of translunar injection. At that point, the rocket has done its job, and now Orion is on its way to the moon. At its closest point, Orion will be just 62 miles from the surface of the moon, and at its farthest point, it will be 38,000 miles past the far side of the moon, which is a quarter million miles away. When we re return to the Earth, the uh, European service module will be jettisoned. It will have done its job, and Orion will set up for its primary objective, which is Earth reentry. After the uh, peak heating period, the parachutes will deploy, and the spacecraft will splash down the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California, where a uh, US Navy team and NASA team will receive the awaiting uh, spacecraft. We'll retrieve all the data off of it, and that will inform our readiness, as well as uh, help us understand um, our ability to fly astronauts on the very next mission on Artemis II. So those are some of the highlights you can expect. We, we intend to bring each and every one of you along throughout the course of the mission. We will share imagery, uh, both from the ground, as well as the launch vehicle and the spacecraft throughout. Uh, our primary objectives for the mission, we've got four primary objectives. Priority one is to demonstrate the spacecraft's ability to re-enter at lunar re-entry conditions. We need the rocket to do its job in order to set up those initial conditions. So all that chemical energy that's stored in the solid boosters and liquid, and liquid uh, fuel that's stored in the core stage and the upper stage needs to be delivered uh, to the uh, spacecraft and put in the form of kinetic and potential energy and then the heat shield will take that back out through aerodynamic drag as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. That's priority number one. Priority number two is to demonstrate the vehicle in the flight environment. That is all the way from the launch pad, all the way out to the moon, and back, back to, um, to Earth. 
In order to do that, we need to demonstrate the uh, rocket's ability to lift off safely from the launch pad. Uh, that 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust is going to reflect off the launch pad and bounce back up in terms of uh, vibroacoustic shock. We have water sound suppression that is there to dampen that shock as the rocket lifts off. We also have these umbilical arms that are roughly the length of a tractor trailer and weigh thousands of pounds that need to retract in those initial moments at liftoff at first motion and clear the path of the rocket as it accelerates up off the launch pad. As we head up through the atmosphere, we're going to go through the period of air, maximum aerodynamic loading, or MAX-Q. The rocket and the spacecraft need to survive the, um, the ascent environment. And then all the separation events. We'll jettison the boosters. We will jettison the service module fairings that are an aerodynamic shell that cover the solar rays during the um, Earth ascent. We'll jettison the launch abort system. And then we'll jettison the core stage. All these things need to work perfectly and in sequence in order to put Orion on its way to the moon. We'll demonstrate the propulsion systems to uh, perform the translunar injection maneuver, as well as the ability of Orion to enter a uh, lunar orbit and then return from lunar orbit. We'll communicate with assets that are uh, beyond what we use for low Earth orbit and terrestrial users. Uh, low Earth orbit and terrestrial users ter typically use the tracking and data relay satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit. They typically use the global positioning navigation system that is uh, halfway to uh, geosynchronous orbit. We're going to communicate and navigate using the deep space network, radiometric tracking, and optical navigation. Uh, we are also going to fly out through the Earth's Van Allen radiation belts. We will no longer be afforded the ability to um, uh, have the Earth's magnetic field shield us from the deep space environment. So we're going to fly into the deep space uh, high radiation environment. And we'll experience what it's like to, to, um, for our astronauts to fly on subsequent missions under those conditions. So that's priority two, demonstrate the uh, spacecraft and the launch vehicle's ability uh, in the flight environment. Priority three is to simply retrieve the spacecraft. We get the high precision avionics on board uh, for uh, programmatic so cost savings and reflight on later flights. We also get the spacecraft structure back for environmental testing on later flights. And then we get all the data that's recorded on board. We're going to have a blackout period uh, during peak heating. A plasma field is going to envelope the spacecraft during reentry, and we will not be able to communicate with it. So the telemeter data. Uh, that would normally come to Earth is not going to be able to uh, be received on the ground during that period. So we're going to get all this data back to help us understanding uh, our engineering uncertainties as well as uh, what the flight environment was like from launch to splashdown. That's priority three. And then priority four is to uh, perform some payload objectives, and Bavia will talk to you about the payload objectives. It is to perform outreach and share uh, remarkable images with each and every one of you. Uh, images that include Orion taking selfies down the solar ray wings of itself in the foreground, the moon in the background, and the Earth a quarter million miles away. So we intend to bring each of you all along as we uh, conduct this Artemis mission, and uh, we look very much, uh, we very much look forward to bringing each and every one of you on this mission with us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. So as I sit here today, I'm thinking of Nichelle Nichols. Lieutenant Uhura, to most of us who grew up watching Star Trek, who passed away this weekend, as many of you know. She was a great supporter of NASA's. Trailblazers like her are the reason folks like me are at NASA today. And, I, and we honor her with programs like Artemis that will fulfill her dream of a peaceful future in the stars for all of humanity. And as Mike said, I'm excited to talk about the science payloads that will go on this launch that is less than a month away. As Administrator Nelson said, we are going. So in addition to the primary objectives that Mike uh, outlined, there's a number of secondary payloads, investigations, and instruments riding along on the SLS, as well as inside or the Orion capsule objective four, as, as Mike said. These payloads reflect partnerships from across the agency with U.S. universities, our international partners, in fact, five of them. Administrator Nelson talked about the importance of international partnerships, and our Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy often tells us, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And these experiments are a perfect illustration of how collaboration will take us farther when we work together to build the knowledge towards our shared goals. So, on to the payloads. On Artemis 1, we have 10 CubeSats riding along with SLS. 
Each CubeSat is about the size of a small suitcase, a briefcase, or, or a shoebox even, and weighs about 25 pounds. These lightweight platforms enable us to conduct research at lower cost, but higher risk. Of course, that is the point. When it comes to CubeSats, failure is an option. Several of the CubeSats chosen to fly on Artemis I focus on lunar science and may help inform research strategies and prioritize technology development of human and robotic exploration. There are other payloads as well. CubeSats will be testing innovative propulsion technologies, studying space weather, analyzing the effects of radiation on living organisms, one of my favorite experiments, and providing high resolution imagery of the Earth and Moon. Artemis I provides a rare opportunity for these small experiments to reach deep space destinations. As you all know, most CubeSat destinations tend to be low Earth orbit or LEO. But CubeSats aren't the only science experiments Artemis I is carrying. We have other experiments inside the Orion capsule that will prepare us for a permanent foothold in space. Inside Orion, although we do not have astronauts in this flight, we will have a few purposeful passengers who will help us understand the effects of space on the human body. A suited mannequin by the name of Commander Munikin Campos, the name was determined through a public survey, will occupy the commander's seat. And the idea is to provide data on the forces and loads the crew members may experience in flight. It heartens me to tell you that the name Campos is a dedication to Arturo Campos, who was instrumental in bringing Apollo 13 safely back to Earth. Other experiments, so as Orion travels beyond the protection of Earth's magnetic field, it will be exposed to a harsher radiation environment than crews aboard the International Space Station experience. Uh, Mike mentioned the Van Al Allen belts. Uh, outside the Van Allen belts, the radiation environment includes solar energetic particles, and events produced by, by sun during solar flares, and particles uh, from outside the galaxy, galactic sol um, uh, uh, cosmic radiation. As a card-carrying nuclear engineer, I can personally attest that radiation is one of the top challenges for human exploration beyond LEO, which is why there is such a focus on understanding the radiation environment to and on the, on the moon, at the moon. And of course, uh, uh, many of you know, radiation affects women differently than it does men. So in the, in the Orion capsule, we will have two adult female mannequin torsos, Helga and Zohar, that are part of an experiment to study the radiation environment and test a very cool radiation protection vest. I hope you have a chance to look at some of these pictures. They are fantastic. And finally, we have a demo on Orion that reminds me of, what else? <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> the crew of Star Trek was always conversing with the ship's computer that was answering back. Well, the crew of the Artemis may be talking to the ship's computers as well. Orion will carry a, a, a technology demonstration payload called Callisto named after one of Artemis's hunting companions in Greek mythology, to test the technology for a voice-activated virtual assistant. We'll start with commands like turning on or off lights remotely, something we do at home. But this could lead to the technology that eventually turns science fiction into reality on future crewed missions. What we are doing now is not simply returning to the moon as a mission of flags and footprints. We are beginning, as Administrator Nelson said, a long-term journey of science and exploration to the edge of the universe. We have done our early reconnaissance with both robots and humans. Now we are learning what we need to know to be able to spend more time at the moon and then prepare for going to Mars and beyond. There is so much more we have to tell you. Let me just end here by saying that I know when Artemis I launches, Lieutenant Uhura will be smiling. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Pavia. <clears throat> For those who want to learn more about the secondary payloads, we will have a briefing opportunity in the next couple of weeks with principal investigators and representatives for each of the payloads. Now let's head over to Kennedy Space Center in Florida to Charlie Blackwell Thompson. Thank you, Stephanie, and good morning, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today 
and to really talk about our preparations for launch and where we are in our processing and our test operation of, over in the vehicle assembly building. I mean, we are in the final stretch. Um, as mentioned in the previous uh, briefing, we are targeting that launch, I mean, we're targeting that rollout uh, date of August 18th. Uh, we are on plan for that at this time. And just to provide a little bit of where we are in our processing, um, I'll start at the top of the rocket. We did our final Orion power up over the weekend. And so that was all completed. Um, we are working through our payload stows, uh, as described, some of the items that go in the crew module, those are, are in work. And we will keep the Orion crew module open. Uh, the plan, plan closure of the hatch is in about 10 days from now. Um, the upper stage is all complete. Our work there is finished up, all of our testing, and we actually have the uh, LVSA, or the Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter, uh, closed out. The door is on. Our confidence checks are complete, uh, as is the core stage forward skirt area and the engine section. So a good part of the core stage is, uh, is all complete and closed out, ready to roll to the pad for launch. Um, one of the remaining areas that is open is the core stage inner tank, and that is because one of our significant test activities that's upcoming, the flight safety system or the flight termination system test is scheduled to begin next week. And we do need access uh, to the core stage inner tank area for that testing op. Uh, we also need access to the uh, forward assemblies on the boosters and uh, for that test as well. Uh, other than that, the booster work is pretty much complete. We have been working some of our, um, our thermal curtain closeouts. The left-hand booster is complete, and there's a little bit of work remaining on the right. But again, all of the work is on schedule to support our planned rollout date. And as we finish up these ops, we have already started our platform retract. So out of the 10 platforms we have over in the VAB, three of them are already in the retract position. And as we continue to to finish up our work, we'll pull the remaining platforms back. We had some software updates after our wet dress test campaign. Uh, those have been completed and rolled into what we call our TCID, which is essentially our software set that we'll use for uh, a simulation that we have planned for tomorrow and we'll use for launch. That was loaded into the control room last night. So that is now complete as well. Um, we do have our final launch team training event tomorrow. It is a full simulation from cryo load all the way through terminal count, and we're certainly looking forward to getting that uh, sim behind us and, uh, and getting that final chance to practice launch countdown uh, before our big day arrives. So once the work in the VAB is completed, um, we will head out to the pad. Uh, we have 11 day pad campaign very similar to uh, what we've done in the past. Um, we'll roll out, uh, get the vehicle hard down, validate the, uh, the services, the command and control data, telemetry, um, any of our commodity connects. And then we'll uh, get into our work over in Orion, uh, extend the crew access arm, open up the hatch. Um, we do have some testing, some program specific engineering tests that we'll be doing. These are similar to what we did in our first campaign for wet dress uh, one. We do have a few additions there, but we'll take care of that as well as servicing the boosters and our launch countdown preps and then into to launch countdown itself. So for that August 29th uh, launch attempt, we would look to have called the stations at 0953 on Saturday the 27th and our tanking operations would begin early in the morning on Monday. We have added a little bit of time to our countdown. Um, we added an hour of time to our hold before the tanking, and that was to take care of a couple of things. Uh, the first is, as part of our wet dress loading operations, we found we needed a little additional time, and we wanted to make sure that we were all set up and configured for an on-time launch. Um, we will get into our tanking ops, and then once that is completed, the loading sequence is the same as what was demonstrated during wet dress in terms of we start with core stage uh, and start with locks, then LH2, uh, and then we'll pick up with the upper stage load, uh, LH2, and then locks. Once that is complete, we have some range safety checks that we'll perform. We demonstrated those during wet dress. We, we will demonstrate them again for launch day, and, uh, and then we'll get into our terminal count. 
will count down uh, through those critical milestones uh, down to um, to T0, where we'll hand over at booster ignition and lift off uh, to the flight control team. So as several others have said, uh, this is a very exciting time. Um, this is our first launch. It's been a great learning experience for our team as we've gone through the testing, the wet dress campaign, uh, and rolled those lessons learned uh, into our launch planning. And, uh, and I expect that we'll learn, we'll continue to learn some things as we go through launch countdown, but uh, I am very pleased with where we are in our preparations and uh, certainly looking forward to finishing up the work in the VAB, seeing this amazing vehicle roll to the pad and finish up the final preparations for launch. That's great, I can't wait to see it. The mission has been so many years in the making and so we have a brief video to share with you reflecting on the work that has brought us to this moment. Just awesome. So now we will go to John Honeycutt to talk to us about the Space Launch System rocket, and then over to Johnson for Howard Hugh to talk about the Orion spacecraft. Over to you, John. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I, you know, I like to start off by telling you that uh, a lot of our team spent a good part of their career at NASA working on the, the space shuttle on missions to uh, low Earth orbit. And we learned a tremendous amount about designing and operating the uh, the space shuttle, and and designing and operating well, a launch vehicle built uh, for human exploration. So now, for the first time since 1972, we're going to be launching a rocket that's designed for deep space. Um, our team really took advantage of everything that we learned from flying the shuttle, and of course from the Saturn V rocket. Um, I will tell you that we've got an we've got an excellent design in the rocket, and we we understand where our margins and our sensitivities are. Uh, and I have a high level of confidence that we will be able to safely send humans into deep space. Um, you know that if you've heard others talk, you know the propulsion systems for SLS made up of the solid rocket boosters and the RS-25 engines really gives us a lot of confidence that SLS is going to be able to meet those performance targets that are, are required. Um, you know, the rocket's also extremely powerful, as you've heard. It's, uh, it's, it's the only rocket that's capable of sending Orion and a crew and supplies into deep space on a single launch. There's a, a really huge advantage in the SLS that it gives us uh, availability for a lot of cargo and supplies that are needed to uh, have successful missions. Um, as far as the testing goes, you know, we've tested every component on the rocket. Uh, those components uh, got uh, integrated into a, a subsystem. Those subsystem tests were performed. And then finally, all those subsystems come together uh, to make up uh, the system levels 
of the rocket in the in the boosters, the core stage, the ICPS, and the LVSA. There's a, a tremendous amount we learned in those system level tests, uh, starting with the green run and then going through the wet dress rehearsal test that we recently completed. Uh, this test flight will be uh, one that provides us a tremendous amount of data and I expect we're going to learn a lot uh, from the thousands of sensors that we have on the rocket. Uh, I'd like to share with you just a little bit about uh, kind of the things that I'll be looking at as we get really close to, to that T0 time to, to see SLS lift off the launch pad. Uh, as we get into what we call terminal account, I'll be I'll be looking at the pressurization systems, the pressures in the liquid oxygen tank, the pressures in the liquid hydrogen tank. I'll be looking at the, the startup of our auxiliary power units that power the hydraulic system uh, to make sure that we've got good hydraulic pressures. We'll uh, light the engines at roughly T minus six seconds, so I'll watch those come up uh, to the required power levels, uh, and then we'll get to see the boosters ignite. And as you've heard, those will burn for about three minutes. We'll separate from them. And then the core stage will continue on for about eight minutes, uh, at which time we'll separate. And then uh, we're getting close to uh, the time where the upper stage will take over in about two hours. And so as you heard, we'll do a a couple of burns with the upper stage on the rocket, uh, one to raise to orbit and, and the other uh, to set Orion on its way to the moon. And then the final thing uh, that SLS is responsible for will be uh, to deploy those 10 CubeSats and get them on the way that you heard about earlier. Uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to Howard Hugh. Uh, Howard's the Orion program manager and Orion's gonna share more with you about uh, the Orion journey. So, Howard. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. Um, certainly very exciting times in the Orion program as we embark on our first uh, mission to the moon with this fantastic uh, rocket and, and our uh, Orion spacecraft. You know, this so far, uh, this uh, Orion team, we've done a tremendous amount of work getting ready from designing, manufacturing, and uh, testing the spacecraft to ensure its success as we embark on our first mission to the moon on Artemis One. You know, it's been a very collaborative effort across multiple NASA centers with our industry partners and, of course, our suppliers across all 50 states and including the European uh, team as well. Administrator Nelson mentioned earlier, uh, the European team is a very important part of the Orion spacecraft. Uh, European Space Agency and their um, industry partners across 10 European countries is responsible for building the European service module. It's the powerhouse uh, side of uh, the vehicle where it's the, got the primary uh, propulsion, power, and life support resources we need for Artemis One. You know, one of the things that uh, is very important and, and the video reminded and brought some good memories back of all the testing we've done on the spacecraft, both in Europe and in the U.S. You know, we've had significant uh, effort not only testing every component, spending hundreds of thousands of hours uh, testing those components, testing the, the uh, integrated system and testing the Artemis One spacecraft. Uh, really, really great uh, tests that we've performed. And of course, we've also had three previous flight tests, two uh, test, testing our launch abort system, and of course, the exploration flight test one, which, which we were able to demonstrate uh, some of the crew module capabilities along with the parachutes. Uh, so that was very good uh, in terms of being able to check out the systems, not only on the ground, but our previous flight tests uh, to be uh, ready for Artemis One mission. Now. You know, as, as, as you may have heard and, and, and heard from others, you know, Orion is designed for a deep space um, type of mission at the very beginning. Our core systems, we're using advanced life support systems, avionics, communication, guidance and navigation and control, uh, software and hardware. And all those systems are reusable uh, going forward as well. So it's really important that we have a, a good opportunity to test those systems uh, together on Artemis One. And of course, uh, 
Administrator Nelson also mentioned our heat shield, you know, the biggest heat shield we, we ever built to withstand the lunar entry velocities of 25,000 miles per hour. And it's certainly very important that we accomplish that objective as part of Artemis One and really demonstrate what we know from our ground testing, the capabilities of that heat shield. And finally, you know, as, as you're hundreds and thousands of miles away from home, our Earth, you know, you want to make sure you have uh, capability not only to ensure crew safety, but also recover from contingencies. And we built systems on board, uh, not only backup systems, but uh, hardware and software that allows allows a crew to have a complete insight into the vehicle and be able to recover, along with autom automated um, uh, fault detection and recovery recovery software that will be important to help and assist in that kind of uh, situation. So overall, you know, when we look at the uh, Orion systems, we have a, not only the primary systems, but we also have a lot of capability to ensure our success in, uh, in the event of a contingency. And finally, you know, we're very excited for Artemis One mission. It is going to be fantastic. You know, we're, we're going to be able to execute the entire spacecraft system, demonstrate all our capabilities that we've shown on the ground in that uh, harsh deep space environment. It is going to be a, a tremendous opportunity to test uh, all those systems together. And of course, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that uh, we're looking forward to as a primary objective is that heat shield performance. You know, coming in uh, on, at 25,000 miles per hour, 5,000 degrees of heating um, in, during reentry is going to be really great to demonstrate our heat shield capability, making sure the spacecraft comes home safely, and of course, for future missions, protecting the crew. And of course, you know, the other substances, I can't forget about those, uh, along the mission, we'll be testing those as well. You know, Mike mentioned optical nav. We're looking at optical nav performance as we go out uh, to the lunar orbit. We'll be checking out our primary um, space shuttle uh, uh, orbital maneuvering engines that we're using as our main engine um, and checking that out prior to uh, lunar injection. And of course, we're going to be checking out our end-to-end -end comm system, you know, using that deep space network. And that's going to be a tremendous uh, opportunity for us to uh, utilize that uh, capability and make sure we have uh, communication with the ground. And of course, you know, finally, you know, when we come back uh, from uh, lunar trajectories and we're about to land, our parachutes are going to deploy another opportunity for us to demonstrate our parachute performance and, of course, our recovery operations as well. So, you know, Orion has uh, gone through a lot of testing, a lot of preparations. Uh, Charlie mentioned our final uh, power-up last uh, few days ago. We're ready to move forward and we're certainly excited to be part of this Artemis One mission. Can't wait to launch on the SLS rocket and uh, we're ready for getting to the moon. Thank you, and back to headquarters. Great, thank you. Uh, our, question, our experts will now address questions from reporters. You can press star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. Your phones are on mute now. The operator will open your mic when we call on you for a question and close it afterward. Especially because our experts are in several locations, please do identify to whom you are addressing your question. Please respect everybody's time by keeping it to only one question, and if we have time, we'll do a second round of questions. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. First up is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Oh, hello. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is perhaps for Mr. Serafin, Mr. Honeycutter, even the administrator. I was hoping you could briefly compare the SLS rocket with the Saturn V and also SpaceX's Starship, the pros and cons. and could you also touch on what's at stake here? How crucial is it for Artemis One to succeed? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Marcia. Uh, in terms of comparison of SLS to Saturn V and, and Starship, um, obviously we've got uh, flown test data on Saturn V, and uh, as was stated earlier, the, the performance of the Saturn V was, was about 15% less than what we expect for the space launch system under this current uh, initial configuration, which we call Block 1, which is with the interim cryo propulsion stage. When we upgrade uh, later to the enhanced upper stage, or what we call Block 1B, uh, we'll be able to deliver uh, even more cargo to low Earth orbit. And um, we'll go from 70 metric tons to roughly 105 metric tons. Um, so it, it, that's a relative comparison to uh, the, um, the Saturn V. 
now in terms of comparison to Starship, uh, you know, they're working through their test program. I, I think that question is, is more appropriate for SpaceX. Um, however, uh, we know that their model requires refueling uh, in low Earth orbit uh, in order to deliver crew and cargo uh, to, uh, to the moon or, or wherever their destination is um, beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, so as John Honeycutt said earlier, uh, SLS is designed uniquely to deliver crew and cargo uh, to the point of translunar injection in one shot. So I don't know, John, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, nothing more to add, Mike. Well, I'll add um, your question, uh, how important is this that it works? Well, it's very important uh, because this is a test flight. We are actually going to push this test flight, uh, stress it more than we will with a crew on board. And one of the things is the uh, heat shield. Uh, it's a test flight. The heat shield's not been flown before. That's why you do a, a no crew test flight first. We didn't have that luxury uh, on the space shuttle uh, because you had to have a crew on board, but it had already tested uh, a number of elements uh, those silicon tiles on the space shuttle. This is an ablative heat shield, and the only way you can test it is to get it out there and let it come in at 32 Mach. Uh, so that's very, very important. With regard to the comparison, uh, we often hear this uh, question, well, how does it compare, et cetera? This is the only rocket that can now go with a spacecraft to the moon. We expect that SpaceX will have their lander ready, but that's not a return. Uh, that's a lander on the moon, and that'll be for Artemis III in the landing, which we hope will be late 2025. The other thing that you should know is that when we have a crew and we go into that, what they call the NHRO orbit, that rocket going to the moon has got to pull a left hook uh, and go into a, an elliptical orbit around the moon that is as if it is the face of a clock facing us. So uh, that's a new maneuver that we have to do that we've never done before. Uh, and uh, remember, uh, Apollo went into equatorial orbit. This one's going into polar orbit, and it's also going to be an orbit that is lined up this way, uh, this way, facing the Earth, and the uh, spacecraft will orbit there in that elliptical orbit. Thanks, okay. Stephanie. Yeah, thank you all. Our next question is from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, I'd like to follow up on something the administrator just mentioned from Mike Serafin. Could you give us a sense of what sort of additional risk you're all will willing to take with an unpiloted flight like this one that you wouldn't take uh, with a with a crew on board, um, and uh, and well, okay, I won't ask the second question, but that's my question. Thanks, Bill. That's a great question, and uh, the the answer is we have a lean forward strategy on Artemis One because it is an uncrewed test flight. We are deliberately leaning forward in the interest of getting our priority one objective, which is demonstrating the heat shield at lunar reentry conditions leaning forward to get through the point of translunar injection, to put all that energy into the system so that the heat shield can take it out later. So if you're looking at relative comparison to go-no-go -go criteria for later crewed missions, we will be go for uh, failures on Artemis I that we would normally be no-go for on Artemis II on a crewed mission in the interest of crew safety. Uh, because we are 
looking at this from the macro perspective and the manifest perspective, we are trying to buy down risk for crude flights. So we're willing to take more risk on Artemis 1 on an uncrewed test flight than we would on later crewed flights. So that's a great question. Thank you for that. And by the way, that's why this is a 42-day mission. They're pulling all kinds of maneuvers as they go around the moon. Uh, and just remember, it's a test flight. Okay, great. Next question is from Todd Shields of Bloomberg News. Uh, hi, thanks uh, very much. I don't know who should field this. It's, it's very general. Uh, last briefing, uh, you all mentioned three possible dates, August 29th, September 2, September 5. Does that array still hold, and when will we know when you have a definite date? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Uh, yes, the uh, dates that, that uh, we talked earlier uh, with a, uh, a media call with Jim Free still hold. August 29th is uh, our, our target date, and we've reserved that with the Eastern Range. So we've got a, basically a date with a range um, on the uh, 29th of August. If we are unable to launch for whatever reason, weather, technical, uh, incursion into the range, that kind of stuff, uh, our backup date is no earlier than September 2nd. And the reason is during the outbound leg of the, uh, of the mission, uh, for, as Orion flies outbound from the Earth to the moon, we have what we call an eclipse. And that eclipse exceeds 90 minutes, which we screen out is in terms of our launch attempts. So when we have one of those eclipse violations, what we're concerned about is the power production on the spacecraft. So we have um, analysis teams and tools that, that look for these types of conditions and screen those out. So that's why August 30th, 31st, and September 1st are not considered viable um, launch opportunities. It has nothing to do with the performance of the rocket. We could launch those days from an SLS perspective. Uh, it really has to do with power production on the spacecraft. After September 2nd, uh, the uh, viable launch dates go all the way out to September 6th. In the interest of, of uh, holding a uh, reservation on the range, uh, and there's a lot of traffic on the range, we also ask for September 5th. And that is simply based on the cadence. If we were to load cryogenic uh, fuel and oxygen into the core stage and the upper stage, we need time to replenish that. And it'll take us, for our third attempt, about 72 hours to do that. And uh, Charlie, um, as our launch director, do you have anything to add to that? Let's see, Mike, I think you covered it. Um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, those are all target dates and certainly depending on the reason that you scrub and how much commodity you used or how much maybe is remaining in the tank, certainly your drivers. Um, we have all of those discussions at our scrub meeting when we set the official next attempt. But other than that, uh, I think you covered it very well. Okay, great. We'll keep pressing on with questions. The next one is from Jeff Faust of Space News. Uh, good morning. Question probably also for Mike Serafin or Charlie Blackwell Thompson. I recall from the briefing a couple of weeks ago there was still an open issue about the uh, flight termination system and whether it would be certified to support um, all the potential launch attempts um, through September 5th, September 6th. I uh, wanted to see if that had been cleared by the range, that you'll be able to have that system available for all those launch attempts, and if there are any sort of other outstanding issues with that, you still need to uh, work out before launch. Thanks. Charlie, you're working. You're working that one. I'll let you handle that one. Okay, sure. I'll be happy to take that. So as part of our uh, standard data review, um, you know, we have provided all of the performance data to the range. That would That's, again, part of the standard process uh, from wet dresses attempts one through four. Um, the range has that data. Uh, they're reviewing it currently. Our requirement is 20 days and our plans lay out to support uh, two launch attempts within that 20 days. Um, certainly, um, we'll be continuing to review that data with the range and should additional days become available, we will factor that into our scrub planning. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question comes from Irene Klotz of Aviation Week. Um, this is probably for Mike, maybe for John. Could you provide some more um, more details on a more granular level what Orion is going to be doing 
uh, during the um, lunar operations? Let's see. I'll I'll start with that one, Irene, and and Howard. You can um, uh, add anything that I missed. But you know, as as we head uphill, Orion will need to be converted from a uh, an ascent configuration or a launch configuration, which is designed to protect abort modes uh, on crewed flights into a spacecraft. And after we jettison the launch abort system, uh, which will happen some four-ish minutes into the flight, as well as the service module fairings, Orion will still have its solar array uh, wings stowed. We will uh, configure some of the cooling systems as well as the power uh, systems after we, during the uh, climb to, uh, to orbit or uh, after we get to orbit um, around the time we do the perigee raise maneuver, we'll deploy the solar arrays. Orion will get off of battery power and onto solar array power. And then a series of systems checks will be performed in order to uh, decide whether it's appropriate to commit to the point of translunar injection. Uh, if we meet all of our, our GO criteria as part of the GO, no GO checklist, uh, Orion will head outbound uh, and then separate from the uh, the interim cryo propulsion stage, the upper stage. And then during the coast phase, uh, we will look at just basically the entire spacecraft health and status. We'll transition off of the space network, which uses the uh, tracking and data relay satellites in geosynchronous orbit. We'll transition over to the deep space network for command and control and communication and imagery and uh, file uploads and downloads. Uh, we'll look at the whole depth and breadth of the uh, systems, uh, both the command and data handling, the attitude control system, the uh, uh, cooling system, all those systems as we fly out through the Van Allen radiation belts. We encounter um, high, uh, high periods of radiation and then uh, set ourselves up for the, uh, the entry into the distant retrograde orbit. That distant retrograde orbit is a two-maneuver sequence. The first maneuver uses a lunar gravity assist to set up an on-ramp to the um, uh, lunar orbit. Uh, the Orion main engine will be fired for that uh, um, lunar uh, gravity assist, as well as for the on-ramp to the distant retrograde orbit. It's called the outbound powered flyby and then the uh, distant retrograde insertion. Uh, while we're out there, we'll do a uh, system shakedown. Uh, Orion will be... Uh, some uh, 270, 275,000 miles from Earth at that point, at its farthest point, and uh, it'll be farther than any human capable spacecraft has ever gone. And then we'll set up um, for return. And when we set up for return, uh, we'll reverse that two maneuver sequence. We'll, we'll perform the distant retrograde departure maneuver, and then a return powered flyby, again, another two maneuver sequence using Orion's main engines. And that is essentially our deorbit burn from a quarter million miles away. And we have to hit the Earth's uh, reentry corridor. Um, if we hit it too shallow, we skip back out in the space. If we hit it too steep, we overstress the vehicle. And uh, that's why this is a test flight. We want to we want to hit that with precision, and the uh, and the uh, command and control system and the uh, reentry and guidance system on the vehicle needs to be able to handle this. And then uh, we'll go through uh, the uh, service module separation. And then we'll reorient the heat shield forward into the velocity vector and about an altitude of 400,000 feet, we'll get aerodynamic capture and we'll slow the vehicle down from Mach 32 uh, to zero in about 20 minutes after the, after the vehicle go goes through peak heating, peak aerodynamic load, and then the parachute deploy sequence once it goes subsonic. And then it'll splash down at about 20 miles an hour in the Pacific. So there's a lot of events. Uh, they are very dynamic. All along the way, we're going to be capturing imagery. We're going to be capturing engineering data. We're going to be um, performing science, as Bobby uh, mentioned earlier, and, and there's, there's a lot of, of sub-objectives within what, what we just talked. Um, so I'll pause there. Howard, um, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, hey, Mike, thanks. Uh, that was a great, uh, excellent summary of all the things that are going to happen ac across this 42-day uh, mission. You know, I'll just add e each individual leg will have uh, checkouts. One of the things I mentioned earlier is certainly we want to check out our propulsion system before we commit to the distant 
distant retrograde orbit. And, and then we're also checking out this optical nav system that'll help us uh, navigate in case we lose comm, um, not only on this mission, but for future missions as well. So really great opportunity to test a lot of systems, not only the primary systems that Mike's talking about, but also uh, other secondary kinds of objectives to ensure that uh, all the systems that we're, we have on board is going to be operating as we need them uh, in this deep space environment. And also uh, add on to, we are capturing a lot of data. We have a, a thousands of sensors on board. They'll be recorded and then during the mission, we will be downlinking uh, the, uh, the data and our engineering team will be looking at it and assessing the performance uh, along with overall health of each subsystem. So thanks, Mike. Great detailed answers, thank you both. Next, we'll take a question from Liam Healy from News 8. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, this question isn't as much directed at Artemis 1, but as the Artemis missions as a whole, so I'll direct it to Mr. Administrator. Um, one of the big things is public outreach on a mission like this. It's always been famously believed that the Apollo missions, some of the lack of funding that ended the program in the end, was due to the lack of public interest. Um, I work in a newsroom full of people, and out of them, out of 20 people that were in our meeting this morning, there were two, including myself, that knew that we were going back to the moon. So what's your long-term plan to keep public interest active with this as we go through the long-term stages of the deep space missions that are planned as a result of this? Tell me what your news organization is. Only two people in your newsroom knew about this? Yeah, we're a, we're a local CBS affiliate in Rochester, New York. Okay. Uh, if you were the local in Orlando, Florida, uh, it'd be a whole different story. However, the point you make is a good one. I remember for years, after we shut down the space shuttle in 2011, the American people would, they'd, I'd run into somebody on the street corner and they'd say, oh, I'm so sorry that our space program is over because they associated the space program with astronauts going into space. Now, anybody who has been awake in the last few months with the James Webb Space Telescope, they certainly have another aspect that they have absolutely been riveted to uh, about what we're doing in space. And as we get to the point of putting human beings on 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust coming off the earth, I can guarantee you that people are gonna start understanding the space program again. And when the first woman and the next man land on the moon in Artemis III, I rather suspect that's gonna be a page one story and it will lead the top of your newscast. And the American people will be back uh, understanding what's happening. Uh, this is part of the excitement of our space program. When you take, although we do these gee whiz things with robots and instruments, and certainly uh, the rover perseverance on Mars and the little helicopter really caught the imagination but you put a human being that's walking around on the surface of the moon and it takes it to a whole new level. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Micah Maidenberg of the Wall Street Journal. Hi there. Um, Administrator Nelson, I just wanted to ask, you know, after all of the investment, the challenges and the, you know, the years of work to get to this point, uh, what kind of pressure, you know, is on the agency to, to sort of meet mission criteria for this first flight and keep moving toward the second and third mission? Thanks. Well, there, there's no external pressure that's going to uh, make this mission uh, go or no go. I mean, this has been in the works for years. And if somewhere in your question was the implication of this being uh, more expensive and taking longer, uh, I would urge you to think about the James Webb Space Telescope. Same thing. 
Uh, but look what the results are because we had to do it when it was right. And there were 244 things, any one of which on the way to a point in the universe a million miles from Earth, any one of those 244 things that had not gone right, it would have been Tube City for the telescope. Same thing with this. Now, as we get on down the road, we're doing different contracts, putting more emphasis on efficiency uh, on our commercial partners. We're taking a bunch of contracts and consolidating them. And what you'll see is the cost is going to come down. You are amortizing the development cost in these first few flights. Over time, per flight, that cost is going to come down. But regardless, space is hard. And when you're developing a whole new launch capability to support human life and bring them back safely, it's, uh, it's going to cost some money. Thanks for your question. Thank you for all the questions. We unfortunately have more questions than we do time today. However, we do have another briefing on Friday, uh, August 5th at 1130 a.m. Eastern Time from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. And we look forward to answering more of your questions during that in-depth briefing. If you do need uh, questions answered prior to that briefing, please do reach out to Katherine Hamilton and Rachel Kraft, our public affairs officers who can get answers to your questions. And then tune in on Friday at 1130 for that mission timeline and space after spacecraft operations briefing with us on NASA TV and nasa.gov slash live. You can, of course, follow along with the updates for Artemis 1 and check out the latest mission resources as well, including the press kit and reference guide on NASA's website. That URL, which is all lowercase letters, can be found at nasa.gov slash specials slash Artemis dash Roman numeral 1. Thank you for joining us and have a lovely day.